Can you hand out the envelopes? Because I want to share something quickly about offering. I'm going to share something that may not seem that it's about it. And then we're going to bring Shannon up to bring us the word of God today. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <coughs> uh, Proverbs chapter. Okay. Before I read this, I'm going to make a statement. Okay. And this is a tough one. Gambling is wrong. You just said a minute ago. What I said. You just said you were doing that as a kid. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it was wrong. I was good at that too. <laughs> I was at my job. We they had we had won a bunch of sales. And they said we're gonna roll dice to see, you know, and everybody knew my past and the projects and gambling. And they was like, Gary, you be the first one to roll it. I was like, I was like twelve. They was like, oh man. I was, I was like, so I'm not going to glorify it. Amen. <laughs> and so, and, and people at my job, they, they, they uh, are, are starved today that I don't gamble. But, but gambling is wrong. Okay, I'm going to give you a, a real quick analogy. It's not a win-win, it's a win-lose. It, it, why do they, I just watched a movie the other day about the high school kid who, uh, why when somebody gets good at it, do they want them to stop? Because how they make a profit is that somebody lose. It's a, it's a, and that's not something that God is in. Playing the lottery, okay, is putting your hope in a different system that does not build character. The Donald talked about that. It does not build character. I feel impressed really hard to stand here today. To say. Now let me give you the scripture. It's in Proverbs chapter 13, verse number 11. Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathered by labor. Mm -hmm. The word vanity is something that has no value. But since those that by labor, it says they shall increase. There's no value. There's no value in what you get. It's just money. There's no value. If you're buying a car, that's a win-win. You get a car. You get a $40,000 car. You get a car. And we get money. It's a win-win. Are you hearing me? It's no value. And it says, wealth gotten by vanity. How many stories have you heard of people winning a lot, their lives falling apart, losing everything? Right. It is a spiritual principle. Do you know it takes more faith to have money than to not have money? And so they don't have the character to maintain a million dollars, and it destroys them. But those who labor and work for it, amen, they learn, they appreciate it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And I'm just trying to tell you, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 11, has no value. Playing that dollar, it has no value. Has no value. Because when you're prospecting customers, whatever, you're not gambling, you're working. Amen. Amen. That's labor. Yep. Amen. And you can count on that. You can bank on that. Amen. I don't care. I don't care if you win a million dollars. I don't care if you win $20 million. I still would not be encouraged by that. I would still not say that that is a blessing. Well, you mean, are you telling me, Derek, everybody? Went, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just trying to tell you about gambling. God wants to put our faith and our efforts and ideas and visions and dreams. Amen. Use your faith. But paying a dollar for a lottery ticket, amen, that is not God's way. Because you know what it does? It messes with your hope. Because God is a jealous God. Your hope is in the system. It's not even in God. And some people say, well, if I win the line with God, I'm going to give you half. <laughs> they try to entice God. Now the Bible says this, be faithful and little, and then he'll give you more. So my question is, are you giving half now? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> 
If you're not giving half now on that $20 million come, trust me, you're not giving half, we might not even see you. <laughs> because you'll have that check and you'll be like, they'll be happy with a million. <clears throat> what happened to the 10 million? Oh, maybe the pastor with 50,000 be enough? That thing will dwindle for you. That thing, pastor, read that check. $320. I mean, are you <laughs> God bless you, sister. Amen. I don't want people like that. I don't want money like that. I don't. Because you know why? That $20 million is a bunch of families that bank their whole life and bank up their houses. And if you've never seen anybody bank up their houses, I told you I can't that bank up their houses. It is the blood, it is the sweat of people putting their hope in the system. And you are spending money that people have lost their lives and their homes are wrecked and marriages are destroyed over that money that you are enjoying by one person. And who knows how many millions of lives are destroyed by the money of one person enjoying. I'm just telling you it's wrong. It's not God's way. Even though I live by gamma, I started this conversation. Amen. So, but as you give today, amen. And so you, like she said, use your faith. Gamble with your faith. Amen. Sow your seed. Amen. And, and, and trust God. Amen. prosperous, right? Um, I told you how many times prosperity, prosper, prosper, some form of the word prosper was mentioned in the Bible, right? And uh, I've lived on that. I've lived on that since 2003 in behind prison walls. I, I've lived on that, on, on those principles. And uh, 
Um, it, it's, I start thinking about it. I start thinking, but God, why doesn't it, okay, if I can tell people to have that faith, and maybe they're believing that faith, and I'm seeing these people give a tithe and everything, where are we missing the boat at? Right? Maybe it's timing. Maybe it's something like what Derry said when he said, you know, anything that you've been through that may be bad, God is using it for a purpose. I, I strongly believe this. I heard T.D. Jake say this once. Nothing you've been through will be wasted. Nothing you've been through will be wasted. So all those bad things you've been through up to this point, they were for a reason. So God does not waste anything. So I was like, is it timing? What is it? Right? And he showed me something. I got introduced to, to a, 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 a wonderful teacher lady. Um, got to go to one of her seminars. Tammy was there. Uh, but before I even went to what this lady was, I picked up her book and I started reading. I was two chapters in. And it was just like God just said, tap, tap. Oh, by the way, I went to a boxing class today. I know how to do it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that was just hitting me left. I remember telling God I couldn't put the book down. I was like, there's the answer I was looking for. Okay? And he showed me. Poverty or prosperity? The choice is yours. Do you know that? Do you got, who believes that? Okay? So you say, well, I choose prosperity. Do you? Because I'm going to show you. Okay? I know we all say that. But here we go. So first off, the reason I said that what kind of got me going on that was, okay, what do you mean? What, what do you mean, poverty, prosperity, the choice is ours, right? Because do you know that it says in the Bible, obviously, 1 Samuel 2, verse 7, this got me. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. He makes them both. He makes poverty and he makes prosperity. That tripped me out. I was just like, whoa. Okay, so he, some people he makes poor, and some people he makes rich. Why? How does he decide? How does he choose? Right? Another one that goes along with that, Proverbs 22, too, the rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is maker of them all. Okay? There's, there's, you know, it always says the Bible will back itself up. One scripture in the Bible will be backed up somewhere else in the Bible. You've got to understand, remember, the Bible was written over a 1,500-year span. Is that correct, Gary? 1,500-year span by uh, how many different authors? A lot. Yeah. <laughs> a couple hundred. Yeah, so over 1,500 years. And it's crazy because you can read something that was written this time and then 1,300 years later it was you know, edified. So God always says that he'll, his word will not return for it. He's going to make it known. So there's two scriptures right there that God tells you, hey, I make the rich and the poor. Okay? The choice is yours. What do you want to be? Tonight, guys, is all about I don't know if I want to say money, okay? But it kind of is all about money. I want you to go home tonight when you leave here, and when you start thinking about your business and what you're at in your business, and I don't care what business you're in, this, is, this applies to anything, okay? Then here's the deal. You are no longer going to be putting money in those envelopes playing the lottery, okay? Meaning, let's use the example of a, of a, of a TV preacher, and you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and he's telling you, $1,000, so $1,000, so $1,000, pay that credit, you know, I mean, believe that that credit card is going to be made off, da, 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 da. So you write that check for $1,000 or whatever it may be, or, or even, even when I first preached, I said, let's put God to the test, right? And so you put that envelope and you put God to that test, and you just sat and waited. Just playing the lottery. Okay? I'm saying I'm going to show you how. So, um, those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies will have their fill of poverty. So that kind of kind of explains a little bit of what I was saying. You, know, um, you can't just play the lottery and chase the fantasy and say, okay, here you go, God. Rain down on me. You know, he says, those who work their land will have abundant food. You know, it's kind of crazy all the stuff that Darius was saying because I was just like going, wow. It's like God almost put two messages together. Yeah, you know? Um, so, <laughs> now here's a, here's a neat thing, guys. Another thing I was thinking about. Okay, God makes the rich and the poor, Right? So, and also the Bible says God is no respecter of people. So, do we just think that all rich people got lucky? Or are there any better than us? Or people with money? You know what I mean? What are, how are they different than us? Let's just take Nick Sonicola. How is Nick Sonicola any different than us, than me? So if God is no respecter of persons, God made both poverty and prosperity, what is the difference between Nick Sonicola and myself? It's, it's kind of a, it, it's kept me up at night sometimes. And it truly has. Uh, especially when I started looking at it biblically. 
because God is no respecter of a person. What he has done for Nick's on the what he has done for me, he did it 2,000 years ago on the cross. Okay? So we're going to get into that in a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a quick story to you, and then I'm going to show you seven steps to poverty, and I'm going to show you ten steps to wealth. Anybody want to know the secret of how? It's your choice. After tonight, you're going to have the choice. Whether you go home and you remain, or you, you, you become, remain, or are in poverty, or that you take that step to become, achieve, and have prosperity. And whatever that means to you, if it's money, it's money. Okay? Uh, prosperity to me means health and money. Because the more money I have, the more I can give. That's plain and simple how I feel. And sometimes I have to have because I drop phones and I have to buy new ones. <laughs> okay? Um, so the story I'm going to read you is in Matthew 25, verse 14 through 30. It's the story of the talents. You guys notice you'll have some, you have some scriptures on your paper. Um, those are scriptures that kind of stuck out to me. Um, I've got a lot because I've got to prove what I'm saying to you that's all biblical. And, and you're going to have a little bit of homework after tonight, or if you choose. Um, because this lady, I want to give her credit. Her name is Danny Johnson, where I got a lot of this from. Um, also, I get a lot of stuff from TDJs, and then when I take what they say and I pray on it, God just helps me apply it to my life. And he really shows me, like I said, I've always believed in the prosperity, tithing, and giving. And it's always worked in my life, right? But then I started saying, well, God, how come this guy does the same thing, but maybe, but, but he doesn't have the same blessings that I have? What is the deal? Because you're no respecter of a person. And through a little bit of Danny's book, through some other sermons I've watched and through reading over the last week, I think he's really answered a lot of questions for me. So, this is a good one. Uh, this is called the Parable of the Talents, Matthew 25, 14 through 30. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To each one according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them, made another five talents. And likewise he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug it in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with him. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things, and I will make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also, he also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides him. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the, jo enter into the joy of your Lord. Something that's really kind of neat there. You notice one had five, one had two. One doubled to ten, one doubled to four. But it said they both received the same thing. It didn't say the one that only received two said, well, how can you give him five and only gave me two, right? I doubled it just like he did, right? It, it said both in both of those instances, enter into the joy of the Lord. They both received the same joy. You know, I just find that kind of interesting. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast into the unprofitable servant to the outer darkness, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, for the south, you know. Here's the deal. The main point behind that, guys, is, is being ready for Christ's coming. Okay, it involves more than playing it safe and doing a little or nothing. It demands the kind of ser uh, services that produces results. Okay, those who seek, seek spiritual gain in the gospel for themselves and others will become richer. And those who neglect or squander what is given them will become impoverished, losing even what they have. Here's what this says to me. It says that we are all giving, you know, he says there, some people have more talents than others. Make sense? Some have five, some have two, some only have one. You know, it said with the five and the two, they both received the joy of the Lord by taking what God had given them, the ability that God had given them, and going out and giving it. What is freely given, freely given. Okay? Um, you can tie that in so many aspects of your life. 
You can tie it with going out and preaching the gospel. If God, if you are saved, right, the, the number one, by far, top of the line, um, you know, I say the difference between religion and relationships, religions and do's and don'ts, relationship is one dude. Go into the world and preach my name. That's all Jesus tells you to do. So if he's giving you a talent to talk, and, and you're not at least telling people that you're saved and the happiness that you got and, and some of the things that are happening in your life, you're holding your talent. Okay? If you want to take, use it towards, it towards your life and money. Okay? If you're not taking risk, okay? God is ruler of all. He makes the rich and the poor. Okay? <coughs> he, he, it's all his money anyway. Right? So don't play the lottery when you give. Just give. You know, he's giving you those talents. And the more he gives you, the more you're going to have to give because that he's trust testing you with your talents. Okay, I just found that pretty pretty simple because how many of us in life really only have one talent? And we're so scared of what that is that we figure we just keep it to ourselves and keep it in that we'll never lose it. And God's telling you, He'll take that one talent from you and give it to the one that has ten. You know, so think about that. So I thought that was very very interesting. Um, so seven steps to poverty. Okay. By tonight, you're going to have a choice. Poverty or prosperity, right? Do we believe that? Here we go. Let me smile a little bit. <laughs> How hard it was. I'm telling you, this stuff hit me hard over the last three days. So, <clears throat> okay. First one is lazy. Okay, remember, this is steps to poverty. Uh, there's some scriptures right there on the board that actually tells you. Here's the deal, guys. This is only a few of them. But it says you will give, you will gain poverty by being lazy. It says so in the Bible. There's some scripture. Proverbs 6, 9 through 11. How long will you slumber, O sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber. A little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall your poverty come on you like a prowler, and, you, and, and your need like an armed man. He's saying be lazy. Sit with your one talent and do nothing. Uh, Derek said just a little bit ago, understand that when you go out and talk to your client or your prospect or your customer, okay, you're not being lazy. Okay, don't worry about if the person's going to come in your business or not. Let God handle it. Do what you're supposed to do and go talk to people. It started becoming very, very clear to me why the difference between Nick Sarn and Cole and I. It's our belief level. Okay? <laughs> She's it. I see you in the other corner of my eye. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's you. That's <laughs> you. <laughs> okay, so lazy. Lazy is number one. If you're lazy, you're going to have poverty. So, here's the deal. If you are sitting at your house and looking at your list, or if you do not have a list, okay, uh, and you're wondering why your business ain't growing, why you had the NRD, guess what? You're lazy. That's why. Go home and fix it. Plain and simple. Okay? That's as easy as I can put it, right? God is no respecter of person. He makes the poor and he makes rich. He's saying you're going to have poverty if you're lazy. Okay? Don't be scared of who you're calling. You know what? Don't be scared of who you're going to talk to. Let God handle it. Put your faith in Him. Okay? Show Him that you are not lazy and He will show you prosperity. Next one is to be a fool. Here's some scriptures about being a fool. Whoever loves pleasure will become poor. Whoever loves wine and olive oil will never be rich. Proverbs 17, 16, 16 through 16. Oh, that's Proverbs 17, 16. That's verse 16. Why should fools have money in hand to buy wisdom? When are they not when they are not able to understand it? That one took me a minute to understand. I'm gonna let that one sink in for a minute. Why should fools have money in hand to buy wisdom? Why well, close tonight, Your Honor? Keep that scripture in mind. Proverbs 17, verse 20. One whose heart is corrupt does not prosper. One whose tongue is perverse falls into trouble. Number two reason of, of poverty. Be a fool. Ask yourself in your heart, have I been a fool? And there's so many more scriptures, guys, about this. So this is number two. We go to number three. Prideful in prosperity. I had to completely fall down on my knee and lay prosper in front of God when it came to this one. I, I promise you, and I still have to this day. Um, Deuteronomy 28, 47 through 48 says, Because you did not serve the Lord your God joyfully and gladly in the time of prosperity, therefore in hunger and thirst, in nakedness and dire poverty will you serve the enemies of the Lord, the, the ones he sends against you. He will put an iron yoke on your neck until he has destroyed you. That is pretty stout. Shannon, what verse is that? That is Deuteronomy 28, 47 through 48. Thank you. Deuteronomy 28, 47 and 48. 
here's what this says. Because you did not serve the Lord your God joyfully and gladly in the time of prosperity. You guys understand that? Meaning, the more you have, the more you need to give. Okay? Another way to put this. It's easy to pray and, and be on your knees when things are going bad. We've, we've kind of all witnessed that. We've all had something hit us over the, since we started this Bible study. You know? How easy is it to, to, to cry out to God in times of trouble? God wants you to cry out to Him in times of happiness, too. You know what I mean? And that's joyfully serving in times of prosperity. When you have money, are you blowing it? Or are you putting it back into the kingdom? Okay? I like what Danny Johnson says one of the points. Here. She says she's very stout. And I, it, this hit me like a rock because this is where I, I am in my life and where I'm striving to be the best is to be um, kings in the marketplace. <clears throat> I want to be a king in the marketplace. God is preparing a people to go out into the marketplace and whatever that market may be to gain prosperity to put back into his kingdom to further the kingdom of God. I'm going to tell you right now, guys, God can do many things, but on this earth he uses money to finance the kingdom. Okay, it takes money to send a missionary to Belize. Now, could God automatically blink his eyes and send you over there? Yes, he could, but he allows, he does not rob other people the opportunity to give out of their abundance to send his chosen vessel somewhere to preach the gospel and to where nobody's ever heard it. Guys, I understand that's hard to fathom, but I'm telling you, until my and I went to Thailand last year, and I actually sat in front of some people after we preached the gospel in this most simplest kindergarten form, it hit me. Oh my gosh, these people do not know who Jesus is. We take that so for granted in the United States. But when you see their eyes light up, and it's just like it hits you so hard. So, But it takes finances to fund the kingdom. And God is wanting to raise up some kingdom, some kings and queens, but we're going to say kings in the marketplace. He is wanting us to become so prosperous that we are, we are living on the 10% and tithing the 90%. Okay? And just think of your reward in heaven. When you go up there and there's a flood of people saying, because of your dollar or because of your money that you gave, um, I was able to hear such and such in the remote jungles of wherever it may be, and I learned about the name of Jesus, and that day I got saved, and it was because of your dollar bill, or whatever that may have been. Speaking of rewards, can I, can I use that clicker thing too? Yes. <laughs> yes, you may. <laughs> <laughs> prosperity, I'm just saying. <laughs> okay, be prideful and prosperity. That's the third way that you gain poverty in your life. Number four is to hide your sins, okay? Proverbs 28, verse 22 says, The stingy are eager to get rich and are unaware that poverty awaits them. Proverbs 13, verse 21, Trouble pursues the sinner, but the righteousness are rewarded with good things. Proverbs 13, verse 18 says, Whoever disregards discipline comes to poverty and shame, but whoever heeds correction is honored. What do I mean by hide your sins? I don't know what scripture it is, but someone in the Bible says, Confess your sins to one another. First John, oh, uh, James 3.16. James, yeah, three. Oh, that's crazy. I just read that. Okay, James, James, James. Five, six, James, <laughs> five, sixteen. Okay, confess your sins to one another. Why does he say that? There's something to that. I was thinking about this the other day because, you know, when you know you sin, you go and you ask God for forgiveness, he forgives you, right? But there's something about confess your sins to one another. I, I, I'm still, I'm praying on that to get my spirits to know why, but... Accountability. Accountability, that's what it is. Hide your sins leads to poverty. Okay, there's many more scriptures on, on, on hidden sins. Now, obviously you can't hide sins from God because he knows everything, right? So why would hide your sins be one of the steps to poverty? Because you need to confess to somebody, whether it be your pastor, myself, dairy, whoever, your husband, your wife, whatever it may be. Okay? You can hide your dirty or sneaky. Very good. Good point. Okay, next one. Love money. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 10. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied. Uh, you had a question. I think you had a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That was John 3.16, all right? No, James, oh, James, James. James 5.16. I know John 3.16. James. <laughs> Confess your faults is James 5.16. I wrote James. I'm just... James 5.16. I'm trying to keep up and write stuff down, too. Okay. okay. I'll try. I get to talking fast. Can't move too fast. Okay, Ecclesiastes 5, verse 10. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever has, whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. That's a stout scripture right there, guys. 
I mean, it's just going to tell you, you know, if you're just in this business or if you're just in your whatever job or whatever it is for money, and you're thinking money is going to be the key to everything, you know, probably one of the most misquoted scriptures in the Bible, um, I don't know for sure which exact one it is or if I had it written down, but it's where it says, uh, um, oh, actually, I'm going to get to it, but it says, uh, people say money is the root of all evil. Because it, who's ever heard that? Money is the root of all evil, right? Probably well, because they read stuff like this, right? So you know that is one of the most twisted up scriptures that says Satan has twisted that scripture up so much. You know what the scripture actually says? The love, of the love, love of money. The love of money is the root of all evil. But how many times have you heard money is the root of all evil? I can I can think of a lot of times I've heard it. You know, it's funny how Satan can take, you know, you better believe Satan knows his book. I mean, he was quoting scriptures of Jesus. You know, you understand? So he uses it against us, and that's how. But the love of money is the root to all evil. Do you love your money more than you love God? Okay? Because if so, guess what? You're the person with one talent. Okay, does that make sense? Matthew 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So are we supposed to be broke? No. God wants to give us so much abundance. A part of abundance is money. That is crazy. But are you ready for it? Because it says here, whoever loves money never has enough. What are you going to do with your money when you get it? What are you going to do when you become an ambassador? How are you going to spend your money? You know, is life going to be completely different because now you've got a $25,000 bonus check? You know, you have, the, you have the opportunity to make six figures a year. Is that going to change your life? Because God already has the money for you. Your life's already changed. He's just waiting to open the floodgates to heaven for when you're ready to receive it. When he Amen. knows that you're ready to be a king in the marketplace. Amen. And go out and spread what, what you know, hit his kingdom, to help his kingdom grow. Because the more you help his kingdom grow, the more your kingdom's going to grow. Make sense? Colossians 3, verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly na nature, sexually immortality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Okay? Greed. That, that word greed keeps coming up. Love money. Proverbs, or excuse me, Luke 12, 15. Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not, life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. For the love of money... Oh, it was right there. I knew I was getting to it. <laughs> For the love of money, no wonder you guys knew what it said. <laughs> is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Pretty sad. Okay. Next one. Be selfish and stingy. We all, you know what? Here's one thing I can probably guarantee. If I was to, if I was a pretty strong betting man, I would probably bet that you guys have learned not to be stingy. In here. Yeah, I have seen that I have seen that basket full almost every every Wednesday night. And it still to this day amazes me. That's why one that's why this message meant so much to me tonight because I knew that you're doing what you're, what you're believing in on Wednesday nights. Okay? You're you're tithing and you're giving, and those of you that have other home churches, you're tithing in your churches. So I told God, God, tell me what I can give to them. So so that they can figure out maybe where's the crossroad they're at. What might keep What's keeping them? Because if you're no respecter of persons, and you made both the rich and the poor, okay? And I'm going to say anybody here is poor, but does anybody here have the prosperity they're, they're looking for? Yeah. Okay. So God, tell, give me something to show them that maybe they can go home and meditate and pray to you for that, that one thing that might be keeping them from that next level you have. Because you all know God's preparing you for the next level, each and every day, right? You all know that. Okay? If I came from being a pretty good student to play in soccer, to join the Navy and be in Operation Desert Storm, um, to making some choices. God had to bring me all the way back down, but each thing God brought me to, He was preparing me for something bigger, right? I mean, he, he put, who would have thought six and a half years after I walked outside of prison doors that I would be an ambassador with the company, um, standing up in front of people preaching about money, when I've done bad things with money all my life, you know? I mean, it's crazy, right? Let's just go, because each time I became more open to his teaching, he elevated me higher. So, be selfish and stingy. We don't have to worry about that. Absolute, absolute formula for poverty. People who do not give will be impoverished. Okay? 
Proverbs 28, verse 22. The stingy are eager to get rich and are unaware that poverty awaits them. Proverbs 28, verse 27. Those who give to the poor will lack nothing, but those who close their eyes to them receive many curses. Okay. Every reason I've given you so far has verses to back them up. And the word poverty, um, that's the first time I've seen curses. You know, uh, but has the word poverty uh, um, and, and just bad things. So uh, if one of these is hitting you, then you know what you can come to God about time and just say, hey, help me fix that because that might be the one thing that's keeping you from your prosperity, that's keeping you from being the biggest tither or biggest giver in your church has ever seen. You know, so once again, our goal is to live on the 10 and tithe the 90. Could you imagine that? <laughs> Amen. This is a good one. Fearful. Because I know this one hits us all. Fear will lead you to poverty. <clears throat> this one. I found this scripture on that. It was kind of funny because this is one of the scriptures that this Bible study was based on. Uh, Numbers chapter 13. This 12 spies sent to look at a prosperous land. That was, I want you guys to look at the capitalized letters here, okay? This 12 spies sent to look at a prosperous land that was promised. God had already promised it to their forefathers. A land with everything their hearts could ever desire, and then some. Ten of the spies were afraid, and two were not. The ten were not to permit were not permitted to enter the land because of their fear that led to another sin that eventually led to their deaths and the deaths of many others who followed them. The two, Joshua and Caleb, who did not fear God but took risk in acting on their faith, they received the promised land and all the prosperity of it. God has promised each and every one of us already the promised land. Okay, whatever that promised land may be to you. We all know what the ultimate promised land is, heaven. Okay, but he has given us examples. You know, do, do we all know what the Bible's for? Basics, basic instructions before leaving the earth. He has given us, it's funny, I, I've only heard that one time in my life. Wow. Wow. It just came up, but he has given us Examples, stories, everything, and every aspect of life that you could ever come across will, could be found in this book that was written over 2,000 years ago. So this story, as it related to Joshua and Caleb and Moses and the people going to the promised land, relates just as much to you today. God has already promised it to you. It belongs to you. Okay, but if you are scared of your list, if you are scared to talk to people, if you are scared of whatever it is you're scared of, okay, you are coming back and you are and telling the masses that. And guess what you are doing? You are killing not only yourself, but the masses that were there to follow you. Okay? But if you're one of the two that come back and says, yeah, those giants were big as can be. I'm telling you. You know, if you go on to read the story of Joshua, it's almost amazing how almost every, every situation he went up to, he was completely um, um, outmanned, outarmed, um, and God just kept telling me, and I think God did that to him. Matter of fact, so one time when he even had more men, God said, no, I don't want you to take those men, send those and those and those back and take 3,000. If I'm remembering the story correct. One time, they had to come up against a big old fortress, and God said, don't even sweat it, you know? And he's like, oh my God, how are we going to get that thing? You're walking so big, and you're telling me this is ours, how are we going to get it? God says, march around it seven times on the seven time holler and watch the walls fall. How many of you would be like? <laughs> <laughs> Walls of Jericho. Risk. Risk. Who would be willing to take that risk? Follow me? And, under, and, be, and believe in their faith that what God said he was going to do, he's going to do. So, it's probably a big one for a lot of people. I had to, I had to really think about this one today, too, because how much fear do I have? Okay, I'm an ambassador guy, but guess what? I still have a list. And, and believe it or not, I still am a little afraid to call a few people. And I sold cars. That's what we did for a living. You know what I mean? Isn't that crazy? But she tells you how the devil works. He's a little sneaky little fairy tale. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I mean, I ain't gonna lie. Here's the deal. With the power of Christ, I mean, he, he's defeated. God defeated him, right? But he's tricky. Makes you think he's stronger than what he is. Does he have powers? Yeah, he does. But guess what? He that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. All it takes is me to believe that he's just a little forfeit fairy and I can flick him wherever I want. Okay? <laughs> But he comes in my ear and says, oh, you know, but I often think of David when that happens. 
Because when the whole army of Israel was scared, David stepped up and said, who is this creep talking bad about the Lord's army? Watch out. You know? So, just understand, he's a little fairy. But if you let your guard slip, you let your guard slip, you'll become that big giant. So, get past your fear, okay? Okay, here's the good one. That's the seven steps. Now, here's the deal. Very interesting. First off, I want to repeat this scripture because I said this one time. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 19. I, this, this, this scripture has blown my mind ever since I came across it a few weeks ago. Money is the answer to everything. That is in the Bible. Well, the Please. Please. Huh? Right. What? Ecclesiastes, right. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 19. Money is the answer to everything. Okay? I don't know why I said that. I understand because a lot of people will tell you, you know, once again, the love of money is the root of all evil. Okay? So God said, don't love money more than me. However, he also tells us money is the answer to everything. So what he's telling you is, I'm, I've got it here for you. But when you're ready to receive it, that's when I'm going to give it to you. And whatever avenue he's going to give it to you from. If you're not lazy and you're going out and calling to your people and you're, and you're not hiding your sins and you're not being lazy and you're not fearful... You fall, you fall, and, and, and you're not having pride when he does give you that prosperity, you can keep all those things out of your life. He has more abundance for you. The windows of heaven will pour open and just rain on you like you've never seen before. So now we get to, get to the good part. Um, you know, here's a, now, I was telling you, there's a lot of scriptures that back that kind of stuff up, right? Here's a beautiful thing. There are more scriptures in the Bible that talk about prosperity than there are poverty. Okay? It pleases the Lord to make you prosper. <laughs> if you fully obey the Lord your God, this is Deuteronomy 28, 1 verse 8, if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all His commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set, on, set you high above all nations on earth. All the blessings, all these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed. And the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the cows of your herds, the lambs of your flocks, your basket, your net and through will be blessed. Blessed, 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 blessed. Bless. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he has given you. I'm going to tell you what that says right there. That just says that uh, uh, if you follow him and, and obey him and love him, if you go and read, well, we can't. The Old Testament just gives us so much we can't. Guess what? The God, God rewrote the covenant. Love your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. On these, the rest, the rest, lay the rest of the commandments. Because if you have love in your heart, everything else is going to fall into place. Okay? Deuteronomy 20, verse 63 says, Just as it pleased the Lord to make you prosper and increase in numbers. Okay? God wants you to prosper. Um, here's some more scriptures, guys, if you want to look those up. Proverbs 11, verse 25. Proverbs 28. Matter of fact, here, here's what I, I challenge you to do over this next week. Go start researching in the Bible. Proverbs is a very good place how God wants you to prosper. Okay? There's a lot more of them in the Bible about prosperity than there is poverty. I'm going to try to get through this really quick. Um, <laughs> Derry said something else just a little bit ago that kind of leads right into this too. But um, if what I just told you, God said, if you follow my commands, okay, I, you know, here's the deal. My, remember, I just told you, God already has the money for you, right? It's right here in black and white. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14. Jeremiah 29, 11, 14. I, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. He had this plan for you. 2,000, I didn't even know this was good. Okay, this plan has always been the plan for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. It's there for you, okay? Um, so I'm going to read these things to you. Here you go. Here's the key secrets of prosperity. Are you ready? <coughs> yes! <laughs> Don't love money more than God. Work with a spirit of excellence. Know that, know that the money he has given you is for a bigger purpose than for yourself. What that means is no matter what your job is, no matter what you're doing, if it's cleaning toilets or if it's a CEO of a company, work is that you're working under Jesus Christ. Okay, what was the third one? Uh, that was, no, that's only two. It's number two. I was just explaining number two. You said don't love money more than God. Don't love money more than God. Number two is 
Um, work with a spirit of excellence. Know that the money he is giving you is for a bigger purpose than for yourself. So if you're always working as you're working unto God, um, um, you know, you'll always be blessed. That's a way of prosperity. Number three, know your money's purpose. Okay? When he gives you the money, know what purpose is for. Number four, know that it's God's money already. Okay? Number five, be generous. Number six, give. Are you okay? Where are you at? Where are you at? Number three? Five. Yeah, number five. Number five. Number two. <laughs> number two, work with the spirit of excellence. Okay? Number three, know your money's purpose. Know your money's purpose. Know your money's purpose. See, I'm not used to this preaching thing. Does not, do you guys have to do what you say? Slow down, sucker. Doing great. Number five, be generous. Now four. Four, four. four. Number four, know it. Know it's God's money. What was number one? Don't love money more than God. All right, thank you. Gracias. You go just do that one. <laughs> Ready? Yes. Number five, be generous. Number six, give into the right soil. Give Give into the right soil. Give into the right soil. We talked about this when we talked about our giving um, at the beginning thing, and we've talked about it a couple of different weeks. But uh, you guys understand that that not all giving is good giving. You yeah. know, make make sure you know where you're giving. Yes, sir. The only thing in Deuteronomy, if you give to a dead, if you give to a dead ministry, you're not going to gain nothing because something like that I read about. I have to look at that. That's good. <laughs> I see I know, it goes right along with this. I'm about to find it, but well, I've seen in Deuteronomy, if you give, don't plan in a dead ministry. Yeah. Well, that kind of fits right in. So, so good point, guys. It, make sure where you're planting your seeds, you plant in good soil. And that's why we knew that this was going to be a great place to start this study. I'll find it to get back. Okay. Uh, I, yeah. To know that because we have that we're like here, we have so many outreaches, and that your soil, you know, you're giving it to great soil. So, see you, girlfriend. No, bless. Like Danny's yeah. saying, it's not about a church building; it's about feeding the orphans and whatever. Exactly. Or, you know, so know know what you're feeding your soul into. Yeah. I think what that means when he's saying, "Don't sow it into sow it into good soil, not bad soil." Bad soil be, could be considered that family member that constantly comes to you for money, and you're just constantly giving it to them, yet they're not doing anything or working to get their own money. So you're actually enabling them instead of helping them. So that's sowing yeah. into a bad place. Even though your intentions are good, the ramifications of it aren't necessarily good. Number seven, understand the seasons. I'm going to tell you what that means, but the, the, the point is understand the seasons. Understand that there is a time of plenty and a preparation for a time of famine. Understand that all throughout the Bible, it talks about prosperity, you know, times of where they had a lot, and there was times of famine. So God always, when he knows that you can handle what he's going to give you, and that you can prepare for the times of famine, you will go through times of famine. Maybe you're in that time right now, and maybe because during the time of your prosperity, if you ever had it, that you did not prepare for famine, that's why you're, you're where you're at now. Read the story of Joseph. There's a reason that his brothers... Uh, threw him in the pit, and that he was sold to the slaves, and that he was the leader of Potiphar's house, and then he got accused of uh, adultery, and then he was back in prison, and then all of a sudden he ended up number two in the whole land of Egypt, all because he interpreted a dream that, that, that the Lord told him Egypt will, will, be in, will prosper for seven years and be in famine for seven years. So during that prosperity of those seven years, he kept back, so that when the land went into famine, Egypt was number one ruler because they had all this stuff when the whole land was in famine, so everybody had to come to Egypt to buy so God brought them there for a purpose. So understand the seasons. Know what season you're in in your life. Number eight, prosper where you are planted. Prosper where you are planted. Number nine. So Wait a second. Right. Remember, she was saying that that's like if you have a day job and you're griping and moaning about working there because you don't want to be there and you just want to be by South all the time, you are not going to be successful. You're not being thankful. You just need to do your best at where you are. Here's another thing. For those of you, good point, for those of you that have a day job, but you're working by South, maybe come home from your day job, quit griping about your day job. Work it as though you're working unto the Lord. Okay? Because He's going to prosper you in the time that you're ready to be prosperous. When He knows that you can handle it, He's going to take you up to the top. Okay, 
Number nine is my favorite. Ask big. Big. Ask big. I'm going to let you just figure that one out for yourself. Ask people. This is barely good. Number 10, <laughs> learn from the wise. Very self explanatory. The best way to become successful is to what? Okay. If you want to learn, if your finances, if you're not very good with your finances, guess what? Read a book on your finances. If you're not very good with calling people on the phone, guess what? Read a book. Okay? Read a book. Uh, how to win friends and influence people. Okay? If you don't know how to close a person, read a book. Okay? There's books out there. Always be educating yourself. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Okay, this is gonna this is gonna be pretty sad here. So number three, number three was know your money's purpose. We are standing, guys. I wrote this down because it hit me so hard. We are all standing on the verge of a kingdom. If we weren't, and this, I had to write this down because I didn't want to forget it when it got me. We are all standing on the verge of the kingdom. Why else would the enemy be attacking you in this season of your life if God wasn't going to use you? And then why are you in so much spiritual warfare? It made me think ever since we started this class how much spiritual warfare has been going on in so many different ways. Sicknesses, just all kinds of different stuff. We are on the verge of the kingdom. There's a reason why all this is happening. And if you understand that, get ready. Because if you can if you can if you can grasp that, if you can grasp that and tell God I'm ready, that's why the enemy's attacking you so hard right now. That's why he's after you. Because he knows. You know what? In the book of Job, you know that it says that, that there was a meeting in heaven and, and Satan was there. And he was, you know, and, then, and God was telling him about his great servant Job, and Satan said, Yeah. Take all his money away from him and his family and stuff. He'll curse you. He'll deny you. God said, "Go ahead and go do all of it. You can take everything away from him. Only you cannot kill him." He gave Satan permission to go down and and kill all of Job's. Job was a rich man. Kill all of Job's livestock. Kill his family. <clears throat> Says he lost his wife and his children. Okay, okay. I and mean, he talked about death. Not his wife. Not his wife. Not his wife. Oh, not sorry. Not his wife. See. Children. You don't have to be smart to be an ambassador. And, yeah, <laughs> as long as you don't have people around you that can correct you, you can preach. <laughs> okay. um, but you know what I mean? It just, you put up to so much affliction and Joe never goes God. We are standing on the verge. You better believe that Satan's up there petitioning against you right now. He is. Mm -hmm. Understand? Joe never cracked. Joe never cracked. And he got it all back. And he got it all back. <laughs> you can't have a new year you're still in an old mindset. So if you're still in 2012 mindset, you can't go where God wants you to go in 2013. Let go of it. I'm going to read one more story for you because I thought this was pretty stout because here's time when you go home and you're thinking about some of these things and uh, maybe you know you start to ask him big and you're asking God. I want to read this uh, another story out of the Bible so that you'll know what to ask for. And it's out of 1 Kings, chapter 3. Um, I'm going to start. She's got 1, verse 1, but it's supposed to be 1 through 15. I'm going to explain my fault. I want to start in about verse 7. What is it supposed to be? Uh, 1 Kings 3, 1 through 15. I'm actually going to start in about verse 7, guys. This is Solomon. After his father, uh, King David, passed away, he blessed Solomon to be the next king. Um, <coughs> Solomon... Uh, was, a young, was a young man, if I'm not mistaken. This is what he, what he said to God. Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. How many of us feel like right now we're just stuck, we don't know how to do what we're supposed to do when we're trying to get to RD, right? Uh, but I was telling you, we're learning a lot as ambassadors. Uh, your servant is here among the people that you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your, so give your servant... I'm sorry, let me go back. i got to back up. Number, I'm going to go back to verse 4. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, King Solomon. For that was the most important high place, and Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. Basically, he was going to worship God. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, 
Ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered and said, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in the place of my father, but I am only a little child and I do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or to number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice. An uh, easier word to describe that would be for wisdom. Since you have prayed for wisdom, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my degrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Then Solomon awoke and he realized he had been a dream. He returned to Jerusalem, stood before the Ark of the, Ark of the Lord's Covenant, and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Here's the deal. You can ask for a lot of things, but actually in the book of James, I just found it earlier as I was reading because it was just trying to think about faith and works and stuff like that, and it just happened to came across the scripture and just blew my mind because I knew what I had. But in James 2, verse 14, excuse me, nope, sorry, it's James 1, verse 5, James 1, verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. God gave King Solomon wealth, health. Um, he actually died when he was 80, I think it was, um, because as he was going, you know, we, we fall into traps. But he, he gave him all that stuff because he prayed for wisdom. Let your prayer be for wisdom so that you can learn to discern between what, you know, your team, your family, your finances, whatever it may be. Ask for wisdom. God will give you the rest. Like I said, he's no respecter of persons. You know why Nick Sarnipole is? You know the difference between Nick Sarnipole and me? I finally figured it out when I read about King Solomon. Because Nick Sarnipole is a very wise man. You know? Um, I, I know from some things that I've read, and of course you never know, uh, I've never talked to Nick about Jesus, but but to me he comes across, uh, matter of fact, I think I, I know I've heard Brian. Uh, I got to talk to Blake when he was here. He's a strong believer. Um, Blake actually leads a Bible study, believe it or not. When he heard about this, he was telling me about him and his fiance. Uh, they go on mission trips. Oh, good. Yeah, we've never known that. So we're, we're following a, a, a company of believers. And, um, you know, can you imagine Nick when he was 19 years old asking God when he first went into that uh, tele telephone card company asking God, God, I know you're going to bring me a lot of people, give me the wisdom to run. And now think about his story. Yes, ma'am. Well, times have you heard Blake and Nick talk about? Every dime that they had, they put it all back into their business. Amen. To do the right yeah. thing for their people. Now, here's the deal. Here's, I'm going to close with this. Those of you that know Nick and Blake's story, when every down, all of their downline was, was stolen from them, you know, um, and uh, you know they had to reinvent. Then the company went out of business. They bought the company and they reinvented. Then then you know the economy went bad. They invented. It. They came up with the dot com day challenge and they and they um, uh, invented the pie shape, right? Now look where they are. Nick and Blake, I'm sure at one time asked God to give them wisdom for a company that he knew that they knew God was giving them and for them to be able to run and control everything that God was going to give them. And even through the bad times when the devil went up there and said, yeah, they're doing good because they're 21 years old and they're both making almost a million dollars. Take it from them. I bet they won't still believe in the dream he gave them. You know, it happened three times. He said they did not falter. And I don't know, I'm, I'm saying this is hypothetical, but from knowing the conversations I've had, and knowing the, the stuff they've stuck through, I bet they've got a lot of wisdom. That's the difference between Nick's uncle and me. So my prayer tonight for me and for all of you guys is that when you go home tonight, something that was said between the differences between prosperity and poverty rang true to you. And if you're not in the prosperity where you want to be, go home and ask God for the wisdom to overcome one of the seven steps of poverty that's there. Go home and research your word. Find out what it is that God's trying to say to you so that he can take it from your life and that he can make you so prosperous and abundant because he knows you're ready for it. And then so that at that point, 
when it's given to you, you will be able to give it to your team. That's why God has put me up in front of you guys uh, in certain essence. That's why God brought this Bible study to all of us because it was time. God knew that I would not be ashamed of what, where I came from because nothing I've been through will be wasted. You know, I would not be ashamed to tell you that I love to give. He knew that I would teach you. And you know what? Here's the deal. I know I'm not near where God wants to put us to be. I still have to learn some lessons. And I'm still learning. As I was doing this study, man, I'm telling you, I had to drop on a couple of them. I was just like, you know, um, he has no respect of a person. He is not. You and you and you are no different than me. And I am no different than Nick Sun Cole. Blake Mountain, Ryan Blair, anybody, any prosperous person you can think of, Danny Johnson. He has not given anyone more. He has no respect of person. However, he has given some people more wisdom the others, than others. Think about that. I love you guys. God bless you. I'll turn back over there. Let's give him a hand, guys. <laughs> I got you, Derry. I got you. We call it a That's kind of like my wife's trash take router. <laughs> Her electronic trash take router. So. Amen. Let's just shout out some of those seven things that. What are we? Let's just be honest. Let's be. Remember, they said. James 5, 17, confession. The King James says false. He says sin. But King James says false. One to another. I just want to shout out. Look at those seven things. Let's just look at What are some of the things that you wrestle with? Come on, let's just be honest. Fear. Fear. Huh? Fear. 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 Anybody else? Anybody else other than fear? Come on, let's just be honest tonight. Hide my sins. Hide your sins. Amen. Anybody else? Hide my sins. Probably all of them at some point. Get lazy. <laughs> lazy, not excellent. Oh, what'd you say? Lazy, not excellent. Not excellent. I love that what he said about the, the uh, being excellent. And, 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 you know, I'm, I'm looking at some of these things, you know, and, and like he said, when he was going through them, how it hit him. They were hitting me, you know. And I'm just like, wow. And... Uh, you know, prideful and prosperity. You know, when we do well, all of a sudden, you know, it, like I said, it's easy to pray. You know, when things are bad. What about when things are good? Do you pray just as hard? Do you pray just as hard? And you should. You should. <clears throat> Amen. What about being a fool? If he quickly talk to somebody, do it. 
Don't think about it. Don't think about it. Don't be fearful. Okay, Paul said, you know the most greatest thing in the Bible is ignorance. They don't know what you know. And you don't know what God knows. And so I, I said, God told me to give you this money. He says, oh, I'll pay you back. I said, no, you don't have to pay me back. Okay, uh, give it. Do you know two weeks later, I was sitting at a bench. He was telling somebody the story. And I just happened to be, because he didn't say anything, you know. He said, he was telling this other person, and I'm listening to the story. He said, next week, I'm going to church, and I'm giving my life to God. He said, the night, it was raining outside, and I was stressed out. He said, it was raining down pouring, and I went walking for 10 miles, and I got on top of a bridge, and it was raining and screaming. I don't know where my thoughts was. He said, but I just looked up to heaven, and I said, God, if you're real, help me. And the next morning, the guy from my job comes in and said, God told me to give you this money. Antennas. <laughs> Antennas. But why are we fearful? You talking to somebody could be the miracle they're praying for, and we're too afraid to talk to them. They just don't know it. We need to do it with faith. We need to do it with courage. Like Shannon was talking about Joshua. Man, do it with courage. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. The first thing I had to do when I became a car salesman is God had to deal with me and he says, you are not a crook. And he had to renew my mind with who I am and what I was doing. And like Shannon said, you got to know the purpose. Know the purpose of it. You know the purpose of what you're doing. And when you understand that, man, all the fear goes away. And you can live your life no matter what you're doing, no matter who you are, no matter what happens in life. You never know in that opportunity where you have to speak or share something that might change somebody's life forever. That one little act of being changed somebody's life forever. I mean, it touched me to the deepest part. So I encourage you tonight. I encourage you tonight. Amen. God bless you, brother. Thank you. I'm saying thank you for me. Amen. It deserves a standing ovation. I thank God for that. It blesses me. Amen. To do those things that, that prosper us. Amen. And fight against those things that creates poverty. Amen. If we just do the poverty thing, we'd be all right. You don't have to worry about the prosperity thing. If we just, if we just disregard the poverty thing. But if I can have all eyes bowed, and all heads just ask I want to stay here tonight. I don't want to assume everybody knows the Lord because God never asks us to do anything without His help. And so I want to ask you tonight. Amen. Maybe you're sitting here tonight and you said, you know what? I may have a form of godliness. I may have been in church. I may have did this. But you know what? I don't really have a personal relationship with the God that you're talking about. But today, you know what? I see things differently. And you know what? I want to make a difference. I want to make a change in my life. I, I want to take a step in the right direction. I want to give my life to the Lord. If that's you, I just, don't be ashamed. Just raise your hand so I can see and put it back down. And by raising your hand, you say, hey, brother, dear, pray for me. Amen. Because I want to get my life right for God today. Amen. I see that hand. Then, is there anyone else? Is there anyone else? Amen. Secondly, those who are bold enough to talk about those things that were tough, the laziness and the fearful things, I'm going to say a prayer. I'm going to say a prayer tonight for you. God will change your life. Amen. That you'll be bold. Amen. That you'll be more on that prosperity list. So, Father God, thank you, Lord God, for these people that are here tonight. I speak victory over them. That they will no longer be victims, oh God. That they'll no longer be victims of the seven steps to poverty, Lord God. 
But Lord God, that there'll be victors, oh God, victorious in the ten steps of prosperity in the name of Jesus. That they would overcome fear. That they would overcome doubt, oh God. That they would be bold and courageous like Joshua, Lord God. And that they would prosper in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now I want you guys to all say this prayer with me. And, and for those who are saying, I want to give my life right, I want you to say it. And I want you to mean it from your heart. Say, dear God. Dear, dear God. God. I know you died for me. I know you died for me. And on the third day, and on the third day, you were raised from the dead. You were raised from the dead for me. For me. And right now, and right now, you sit on the right hand of God. You sit on the right hand of God for me. For me. And today, Lord. And today, Lord. I open my heart. I open my heart. And I invite you in. And I invite you in to live with me. To live with me today. Today, I make. you I make you my Savior and Lord. My Savior and Lord. Amen. 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 Now what I'd like to do for the person who wrote the hand, I want to give you an opportunity. We always, we've been doing this and, and you don't have to, but if you want to, Stand up to know who you are so we can rejoice with you and say a prayer over you. If you want to do that, I'm going to give you space to do that right now. Okay. Amen. And so, but, hear me out tonight. The challenge. How many of y'all did the challenge last week? <laughs> <laughs>